It is about giving our faithful, our children, and future generations the structure they need to persevere in the faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, we just heard this sermon, sorry, this gospel, about how our Lord reminds our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph that he must be about his father's business. There are three uh, traditional or classic events in the life of our Lord where we see his divinity and we celebrate his divinity. The first one is the arrival of the Magi at the manger. That shows that our Lord is the king and that he's the king sent from God because the whole world recognizes him as the Messiah in these three kings. The second event is the baptism of our Lord in the Jordan by his cousin or second cousin, St. John the Baptist where the dove descends upon our Lord and the word is heard from God the Father saying, this is my beloved son. We know our Lord is God because of those words. And finally, the first miracle, which we're going to meditate next Sunday, when our Lord converts water into wine, the people know that he has divine power. He's divine. He's God. But also today, outside of those three classic um, considerations of our Lord's divinity, Outside of those classic ones, there is today where our Lord, as a testimony to himself, says, I have to be about my father's business. This is an epiphany. This is a manifestation of the divinity of our Lord and to his own mother and father, but also to the other people that heard him say that. So our Lord is God, and he's the son of God, and he's God incarnate with us. So when we speak of the Holy Family, we know that the, the foundation of it all is God. And then you have the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is the person without any sin at all, even before birth, before, at the moment of conception, she's without sin. And she is the most resigned person to the will of God after her own son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is subject to the will of God. And then St. Joseph, who is, of the three of them, uh, he's still immensely holy. There's no doubt about that. He's just, he's just worlds and worlds above so many people in holiness. But of those three, he would be the least. And God wants him to be the one that directs the Holy Family, showing us that um, since evil has come into this world by man exalting himself, God is going to undo the evil of man by himself, God, humbling himself before man. So, why do I bring up these considerations? Of the, the foundation of the holiness is our Lord Jesus Christ. The most subject to the holiness is our Blessed Mother. The most um, sort of humbled in following the will of God in the Holy Family is St. Joseph. It is because these three are the example for our family life. We must expend every effort to promote and preserve Christian family life because as the family goes, so goes the society in which we live. As the society in which we live goes, so goes the church. So I might be speaking in a sort of a, um, like an anachronism, so in way out of time, but in the 1960s, uh, people looked at the two world wars and said, this has caused millions and even billions of people to go away from God because those two world wars brought in a spirit of um, destroying the monarchies, destroying the Christian center of society, and setting up the kingdom of man. So that would have been in the 1960s. And then look what has happened since then. We have a general apostasy away from God. And this doesn't happen just in governments and states. I think we've all seen it on, certainly in a level of the church. And then we've seen it in the families too. This just sort of getting away from God and putting man in his place. And it leaves us miserable because we don't want to be in the place of God. We need to rise above ourselves to the level of virtue, to the level of supernatural life to find our true happiness. And modern man, if I can say, starting with the wars and then going into this apostasy which followed, has taken that away from us. So we have to restore the holiness of the family 
in order to restore the society, in order to restore the church. I think all of you are working on it in your own capacity. My family worked on it 40 and 50 years ago in their capacity, and hopefully the thing continues. But it's a lot of work. So we ask, what can the church do to save families? I answer, the church, re church rests on the dogma of the mystical body. That is to say, our Lord Jesus Christ is the head. All of us are his members. If the head suffers, the members must suffer. Every one of us has a function to perform to make our Lord walk through this world again. The family, our families, are the mystical body in miniature. And this word mystical body is not just a um, piece of poetry that St. Paul dreamed up. It's a reality. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the head. We are the members. He is sanctified by obeying the will of his Father, especially by his death on the cross. We are sanctified by entering into that mystery of our Lord Jesus Christ and also dying on the cross daily out of obedience to the will of God. We may never actually suffer on a wooden gibbet like our Lord with blood coming out of our hands and feet, but all of us have vices and all of us are practicing penance daily in order to is sacrifice ourselves before God by fighting against those vices. So the mystical body is a reality. And we can best see the mystical body played out in family life. How so? How is that? Well, the father of the family is the head of the family. And who is the head of the mystical body? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The father of the family represents our Lord Jesus Christ. The mother of a family is comparable to the church because our Lord Jesus Christ is married to his church. So our, the church is the bride of Christ. The mother of the family is the, obviously the partner or the wife of the spouse who is the father. She's going to behave like the church. That is to say, she's going to let the father um, sanctify the family by his good example and his hard work and his sacrifice. She's going to take those earnings or gainings of the father and apply it to the children by how she sanctifies the family. You know how um, it's a custom in some places, and maybe it's only in, in movies, I don't know what, but uh, it's kind of common that on the day of the wedding, uh, when, the, when the new couple goes to their new house, that the husband will carry the wife in his arms as they cross the threshold and go into the home. So that makes for nice pictures and something traditional, and I don't know what. But there's some significance there. Uh, what's being shown is that inside of this house, the, the, the one that's going to identify with this house, with this home, the one that's going to either make holiness present in this house or worldliness present in this house, is going to be the one who is the most identified with the house, and that is the wife, the mother. But notice that you know, it's, it's her job to give the faith to the children, there's no doubt, and the sanctity, the piety, there's no doubt. But it is because the husband, the father of the home, the father of the family, is directing in, uh, on the, um, in, the, in the spiritual, in the supernatural way. He's also directing by giving the law to the family. He's also directing by giving the spirit of sacrifice to the family. He's bringing all that home to the wife, and she's the one who's making it sort of incarnate in the members of the family. And the children of the family are like the members of the church. As our Lord Jesus Christ is united to his church in the way that a husband is united to his wife or a man with his bride, there is a result of that union between Christ and his church, and that is all the Catholics, all the Christians sanctified in the world. So the father of the family represents Christ. He comes together with the wife. Because of their union, there are children. These are the members of the church. These are the members of their family. And they are sanctified in as much as the two parents are sanctified. So parents, take your duty very seriously. I'll tell you from a little experience. Um, 
and my father's still alive, so I'm not, I'm not doing a eulogy or something like that. Uh, perhaps my father wasn't always the one directing us with books in the religion and uh, insisting the most on the religion. But there's not one thing we did as a family regarding the Catholic Church that my father was not present for. We understood that the faith is something that comes from the father and the mother. We understood that the father is the head of the family, the one who maintains the law, the one who works hard, the one who sacrifices himself. And we understood that our mother was the one who made all of that virtue of the father real to us in the way that the, the home or the family was brought up in the home. And if you were to take one away, either my father, imagine, not practicing the faith, or my mother not respecting my father by fighting with him or whatever, if you were to take one of those elements away, you would end up with a family that does not take God very seriously. You would un end up with a family that does not repeat the mystical body in their cell, in their society of the family. You need it. So I'm not saying that fathers of the family have to be something like you know monks or every day that they spend, every hour they spend at home, they must be in prayer. I'm just saying that the children must understand the father of the family is not just providing for them materially, but the father of the family is the one who backs up, supports, makes sure that the mother is giving the faith, the supernatural life to the children. It's got to be there. It has to be there. The father of the family represents, or he's the head of the family, he represents Christ in as much as Christ is the head of the mystical body. And the head of the mystical body has this influence on the, the bride or the mother or the wife. Uh, it's, it's, it's like the story of the gospel today. Our Lord Jesus Christ told his mother and father, I must be about my father's business. The gospel says his parents did not understand this. He went down and was subject to them, and her mother, his mother pondered or considered all of these things in her heart. That would be like the church saying, our Lord Jesus Christ demands of us a sacrifice. Our Lord Jesus Christ demands of us great obedience to the will of his Father. We don't understand it. Humanly, we don't understand it in the ways that he insists that we submit our will to his Father and so forth. With all this you know, persecution against the church and wicked things that happen to the church and we're just hanging around trying to be as faithful as we can, we can't understand it. Just like the, our Blessed Mother did not understand the not the baby Jesus, but more like the young boy Jesus saying, I have to be about my father's business. She maybe did not understand it, but she submitted to it. Same thing for the church. The church has to behave in a way obedient to Christ, even though the things are difficult to understand. Uh, in the family, the mother may not understand exactly why the father is insisting on certain things. As long as they're not against the faith, she may not understand what's going on, but it's correct for her to be submitted to that will of the Father because he represents Christ. In a genuine family, there is truly but one will and one spirit, one heart and one soul. The daily bread is provided by the Father and distributed by the mother. We knew that as children, you know. Thank you, Dad, for the, for the money. Thank you, Mom, for the food. We understand it all works. From father and mother, children receive their blood, talking about the conception of a child, and they receive their life, maintaining the life which is brought into this world. The same thing happens in the mystical body. Our Lord Jesus Christ, united to his church, give both the blood and the life to the members of the church. Our Lord, his blood is in the Holy Eucharist, and the life is the maintaining of our supernatural life because of the sacraments. Children must look up to their father. Their father is Christ in a certain way. In Christ, the children must see, they must honor, and they, sorry, in, in, in the father of the family, the children must see, they must honor, and they must love Christ in their father. And remember, this is a two-way street. Like the fourth commandment, it's a two-way street. The children must obey their parents, there's no doubt about it. But the parents must behave in a way which is worthy of that love and respect. The children can't see the parents fighting with each other and say, oh, that's Christ and the church represented in my parents. Uh, they can't see the father behaving in a way which is 
lacking in love and lacking respect for their mother, and then expect for the, 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 the parents expect their children to obey that. No, they can't. They have to see that submission to the will of God the Father, even if there is a lot of sacrifice and suffering on the part of the spouses to maintain this uh, direction towards our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not perfect. I'm sure there's all kinds of, um, you know, debates, difficulties which arise in marriage, and that's, that's part of life. But as long as there's a general movement towards our Lord Jesus Christ with all the sacrifices involved with it, that's what's going to inspire the children. Not only inspire them, but it's going to gain the merit for the children to be obedient to our Lord Jesus Christ. For the wife and mother of the family, she must see Christ in her spouse as well. For the father of the family, it is his duty to live like Christ and to rule his family as Christ would. As mother of the family, your ideal is Christ's spouse, the church, while the children are all members, uh, they're all members alive with Christ. They are cells in whom Christ must grow, mature, and ripen to full adulthood. It's a, it's a pity nowadays, and I think some of you have seen it, have seen it, as liberalism gets more and more seated in the world. Sometimes we even see in our Catholic families where the children of parents have broken away from some of the principles of the family, which really are the principles of the church. And so you see um, children who have, who have become adults and somehow they're not practicing the Ten Commandments, and uh, this is an unfortunate thing. And we look at that and we say, well, if this keeps going on from generation to generation, nothing's going to be left of the church in this family. And nothing's, if nothing's left of the church in this family, what about the other family and the other family? If there's different families where there's nothing of the church left in them, what's going to be left of the church? And it goes on and on, this sort of argument. And I think all of you are here with the traditional Mass and the tr traditional sacraments and hopefully a traditional sermon because you don't want that. You want to see the life of Christ continue. And I think you also understand that for the life of Christ to continue in your families, in your children, and in their children, for the life of Christ to continue, someone, or all of us, have to practice what St. Paul says. I die daily to myself. Daily I am crucified with Christ. I think we all know that. If we're not constantly hearing the word no and no and no to the evil side of ourselves, let's call it the concupiscence of our side of the side of ourselves, with the side of ourselves which wants to disobey God's law. If we're not constantly hearing the word no to those things, even after our baptism, even after taking away the original sin, if we're not constantly hearing the word no to those things, I think all of us understand that we're going to be um, moving backward and backward and backward. As I say, getting away from the law of Christ and his church, getting away from the holy life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We just keep going backward and backward and backward, and then there's nothing left of Christ in our society. Well, we can't have that. We can't have that. And I think that's why we're here. All of us understand we have to identify, we have to unite to that sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the altar in everything we do. Otherwise, we're going to, somehow we're going to be working against our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want that. We want the future of the church. We want sanctifica sanctification to continue. And that means that all of us are going to have to sort of be chopping off something of ourselves every day. Uh, you know, talking about our ego and, and the corruption that's in our heart. So again, we look to the Holy Family. The foundation is the Christ child. Why? First of all, because he's God. But secondly, because he is the best submitter, the person who best submitted his will to the will of his Father with all the sacrifice that imply for him. And then we move to the Mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Lord Jesus Christ is head of the church. Our Lady represents the church. She's the mother of the church. She would have been following her son, just as the church follows our Lord Jesus Christ. 
maybe not understanding everything, but completely submitting herself to the way that our Lord Jesus Christ wanted to run his church, just as the Mother Church herself does. And then finally we arrive to St. Joseph, who is the least of the three, much greater than we are, but the one chosen by God to direct this holy family, to make reparation for man who goes away from God by exalting himself. And we, dear faithful, we are members of the church, which is the mystical body. We are in some way a repetition of the holy family in that our, the father of the family is the head, the wife of the family is the, 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 like the mother of the church, and we are the um, result of this union. And we are sanctified day by day because of our Lord's sacrifice on the altar, on the cross, because of the Blessed Virgin Mary's submitting to the will of her Son, and then all of us are expected to follow those same examples in our life, submitting to the will of God, sorry, the, the, sacrificing ourselves with Christ, and submitting our will to the will of God as the Blessed Mother did. And that is the Holy Family, and that is the Holy Family lived out in our lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen.